Management of Gastric Varices with EUS Guided Coil Ablation. Gastric variceal bleeding is a fear complication of cirrhosis. Compared to esophageal varices, gastric varices are less common and occur in approximately 20% of cirrhotic patients. They are often associated with higher mortality than esophageal variceal bleeding. The overall prognosis depends on the severity of the underlying disease. Commonly used prognostic models such as the MELD score, are effective in predicting the severity of liver disease and estimating the risk of mortality. High-risk stigmata include a large size greater than 5 mm, ulceration or nipple sign requiring proactive intervention. These interventions include traditional endoscopic treatments such as BRTO, cyanoacrylic glue injection, and or EUS-guided coil application, which is done in certain challenging scenarios. We present a case of an 80-year-old male with a past medical history including cirrhosis complicated by esophageal and gastric varices who presented to us with a hemodynamically compromising upper GI bleed and hematemesis. On his radiologic and endoscopic findings, he appeared to have a GOV2 varices that extended along the fundus of the stomach with a prominent bulge and grape-like cluster. On further investigation, these varices appear to be both large as well as ulcerated with the presence of fibrin plugs known as nipple sign. An agitated saline bubble study revealed a patent form in ovale which increased the risk of arterial embolization with endoscopic cyanoacrylate glue injection. A glue procedure with coil embolization of the splenorenal shunt was also considered, but due to the presence of a PFO, he was deemed to be at high risk for arterial stroke. The TIPS procedure was also under consideration, but given the patient's age and high risk for encephalopathy, as well as the need to be on anticoagulation, this was not pursued. Ultimately, we decided to proceed with EUS-guided coil ablation after discussing risks, benefits, and alternatives with the patient. On the cross-sectional CT, we can see the presence of a large GOV2 gastric varices. All right, so this is how we set the uh, EUS needle up for EUS guided coiling. You start by removing the uh, introducer, and then you take our coil that is loaded up on the inside of here, line it up on the back end to the hole in the EUS needle and lock it in place. You'll do your measurement by comparing with your introducer. And load. You'll start to feel the coil drag on the introducer a little bit. Once I'm about halfway, I know that I'm loaded into the needle. So I'll hold my finger in place and pull it back. And I know that I'm loaded that far into the needle. We'll take this off and I will keep it for my measuring device. We'll then load the stylet back into the needle, slowly until I feel the drag of the coil. Now I'm starting to feel the drag of the coil, so I can continue to introduce it. Like I said before, using the uh, coil introducer here as my measuring device. Just want to assure that I'm not pushing it out the tip of the needle. So now I know that I have, I like to leave four or five inches of play. And that is how it's loaded. And under EUS and fluoroscopy, I can guide this through until we see the coil start to coil up. On the retroflexed view during endoscopy, a large varices can be visualized with high-risk stigmata in the form of fibrin plugs.
In order to confirm the location of the varices, we did not pursue an aspiration or injection of contrast. Rather, we proceeded with an endoscopic ultrasound with Doppler, which showed several superficial varices, which was indicative of recent bleeding and the likelihood of future recurrence. The largest width was 36.8 millimeters, and the depth of the network was 22.8 millimeters. Under radiographic guidance, the needle was then placed into the variceal lumen. Once the needle was in place, the coil was then gently advanced in order to prevent coil migration. Once the initial nestor coil was in place, we proceeded with the placement of the subsequent nestor coil in a similar fashion. Once under EUS guidance, we can appreciate the deployment of the nestor coil and further shrinkage of the varices. We then carried on with the placement of a total of 10 EUS guided nestor coils for proper coagulation due to the extensive nature of this variceal network. All 10 coils were placed within the same session. When the needle was then withdrawn from the variceal lumen, no bleeding was noted, which was indicative of a successful obliteration. After placement of the last coil, Doppler revealed minimal residual flow and the varices were near completely collapsed. The upper endoscopy the next day revealed firm and clotted coils without any active bleeding or extrusion of coils. On subsequent endoscopic evaluation, no bleeding was seen, and on follow-up, the patient's hemoglobin level stabilized and a repeat endoscopy the next day showed no active bleeding and shrinkage of the gastric varices was noted. The patient remained stable and was discharged five days after the procedure. In conclusion, we demonstrated a new technique to manage a large gastric variceal network with the use of nestor coils. We were able to successfully obliterate this network in a patient with high risks of embolic complications due to the presence of a patent foramen ovale, as well as a high risk for hepatic encephalopathy.